If you draw a graph on a plane where all vertices are connected to each other and the edges don't cross, then there is a relation between its vertices, edges, and faces. The number of vertices V minus the number of edges E plus the number of faces F has to equal to 2, no matter what graph it is. This is known as the Euler characteristic formula. However, the right-hand side really depends on the surface you draw the graph on. It's 2 on a plane, and if you draw the graph on a torus, it can still be 2, but it's not always 2. For example, in this case, which you can pause and check, V minus E plus F is 0. It turns out that for the torus, there are only 3 cases. It could be 0, like here, or it could be 1, like this case, which again you can pause and check, or it could be 2. In general, V minus E plus F is between 2 minus 2G and 2, where G is known as the genus, or very roughly, the number of holes on the surface. For example, the genus of this double torus is 2, because there are 2 holes in it. The torus has G equals 1, because there is just one hole. So for the torus, V minus E plus F is between 0 and 2, and therefore it can only be 0, 1, or 2. This theorem might be different from what you have seen, because while this is true for all graphs without self-intersections, most literature deals with a specific kind of graph known as triangulation. For those kinds of graphs, V minus E plus F takes the smallest possible value, 2 minus 2G. In the rare occasion that the general case is mentioned, the proof is basically left as exercise. Because it's supposed to be just an exercise, I thought this was easy and attempted it. This video is about my thought process when approaching this. Rather than rigor, I will focus more on the intuition of where the result comes from. I'll let you be the judge of whether this should just be an exercise. Let's start with the plane, because I didn't know how to prove V minus E plus F equals 2 in this case. The usual way is to start with just one vertex, the base case. In this case, there is just one vertex, so V is 1. There are no edges, so E is 0. The whole plane is a connected region itself, so F is 1. So in the base case, V minus E plus F equals 2. And if we subsequently add more edges to it, that is, the inductive step, there are two possibilities. The first possibility is we add an edge and a vertex, in which case V and E both increase by 1, so V minus E plus F remains unchanged. The second possibility is that we add an edge to close off a region. Let's say we join the bottom blue and purple vertices, then we form a cycle to close off a region. In addition to the original phase, we now have two phases. So F increases by 1, but of course E also increases by 1 because we have added an edge, but V remains unchanged, so V minus E plus F is still 2. So whether you connect to a new vertex or form a cycle, every time you add an edge, V minus E plus F remains unchanged. Does this kind of argument extend to the torus? Well, the base case is still exactly the same. There is only one vertex, so V equals 1. There are no edges yet, so E is 0. And the whole torus is not separated by edges yet, so there is one continuous region, and F is 1. So in the base case for the torus, V minus E plus F is still 2. If we subsequently add more edges to it, one possibility is to connect to a new vertex, in which case both V and E increase by 1, and so V minus E plus F remains unchanged at 2. This possibility is similar to the case for the plane. 
The other possibility is that the new edge doesn't connect to a new vertex and forms a cycle instead. For example, in this case, when we connect the yellow and pink vertices this way, E goes up by 1, but because we didn't add any new vertices, V remains unchanged. However, this cycle doesn't help us create a phase. There is still just one phase, because you can go to the other side by going under. So, with F and V unchanged, but E increasing by 1, the value of V minus E plus F actually decreases by 1, and is no longer 2. I've deliberately chosen this cycle because it's a non-contractible loop. That is, you can't contract this loop down to a point continuously on the torus. No matter what you do, you can't eliminate that hole. This is a key feature that separates a torus from a plane. But that's not the full reason why we decrease V minus E plus F when we complete the loop. Let's say we have this graph already and want to close the lower loop. But before that, let's check the V, E, and F. There are six vertices altogether, so V is six. For edges, there are three on top that form the upper loop, two edges on the incomplete lower loop, and one edge that connects the two. So altogether, we have E equals six. Finally, there is still just one continuous region. Even if you are apparently stuck here, you can still go around the torus and get out, so it is still one big continuous region. Altogether, V minus E plus F is 1. If we now complete the lower loop, then E will increase by 1 because we have added an edge, but actually, F will also increase by 1. This is because closing the lower loop genuinely creates a new region. If you are stuck inside the strip, you can't go outside without passing through the edges. So, with both E and F increasing by 1, V minus E plus F remains unchanged. So, even if you have an extra non-contractible loop, you can't decrease the value of V minus E plus F by more than 1. But maybe that's because the two loops are kind of the same? What if the two non-contractible loops are genuinely different, so one of these loops can't be deformed to another? A more technical jargon for this is the two loops are not homotopic. Let's count V, E, and F before closing the second loop. There are altogether five vertices, so V is five. For the edges, there are three on top that form a complete loop, and there are two that form an incomplete loop, so altogether, E is also 5. The whole torus is still one big continuous region, so F is 1, which means that V minus E plus F is equal to 1. Now let's complete the loop. By completing the loop, E has increased by 1. V hasn't changed because we haven't added any new vertices, but F is actually still 1, so the value of V minus E plus F has decreased by 1. The reason why F is still 1 is that if you want to go from the blue point to the orange point, you can go under the torus to get to this purple point first, and then go around the torus to get to the orange point. Throughout your journey, you haven't crossed any of the edges, so this whole thing is still one big continuous region. By considering different non-contractible loops, we can make V minus E plus F decrease by 2, from 2 to 0. Can it decrease even further? Well, we know the answer should be no, because in the case of a torus, this theorem says it can't be below 0. But what's stopping us from closing a non-contractible loop again? The best way to think about this is that this phase, after separated by edges, is topologically equivalent to a plane. These two sides, separated by the loop, can't connect with each other unless we go the long way around the torus. 
so topologically, it's the same as cutting along the loop and unwrapping the whole thing as a cylinder. But then by the exact same logic, these two sides are still separated by an edge, so again, topologically, it is the same as cutting along this line and unwrapping it to become just a normal plane. Because we previously established that on the plane, V minus E plus F remains unchanged when we add edges. When we add any further edges on the torus on the left, V minus E plus F also will not decrease any further. This particular configuration has V minus E plus F to be zero. Because this quantity doesn't decrease further when we add more edges, it will never dip below zero. Of course, we haven't covered all the possible cases, but now at least we have the very rough intuition that V minus E plus F decreases when we complete a different non-contractible loop. Using a similar intuition, if we introduce more holes for the torus, then roughly speaking, each hole can contribute two of these non-contractible loops, so in general, V minus E plus F is bounded below by 2 minus 2G. Technically, when we have more holes, loops like this in the middle are still non-contractible, but they won't decrease the value of V minus E plus F because closing this loop creates a new phase. These two regions are now actually separated by this loop, so 2 minus 2G is really the lower bound. But is my idea for this supposed textbook exercise even remotely valid? I googled a bit harder and found this stack exchange answer. Basically, it states that there are three cases when we add an edge. We have already illustrated each of them separately, but this answer phrases them a bit more precisely in a different way. So my thought process was actually not bad. I've put the link to the answer in the description. While we did prove this more general inequality, which will be useful in the next video, there are plenty of reasons why most people only consider the special case. This lower bound, known as Euler characteristic, usually denoted as chi, is useful in distinguishing surfaces with different genera. Yes, the plural of genus is genera. Not only is it useful in differentiating between different surfaces, Euler characteristic appears in places seemingly unrelated to graphs, from vector fields to something called Morse functions. You can go to the description to see what those are, but I want to highlight one other place where Euler characteristic comes up. These B0, B1, and B2 are called Betty numbers, defined using homology, an important concept in algebraic topology. These Betty numbers generalize to higher dimensions, so you can use this alternating sum of Betty numbers to define Euler characteristic for higher dimensional spaces, not just surfaces. If you want to know more about homology, which Betty numbers are defined with, check out Atheus' new video on his channel Aleph Zero. As always, thanks for the patrons, like, and subscribe. I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.